Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to gather together to sing your praises. Those praises bought by the blood of your Son. Surely none of us could stand before you. Naturally, we were opposed to you. In our activities, we hated you. In our very nature, we were antagonistic, and you rescued us, making friends out of your enemies, making children out of those who were alienated and hostile. We thank you that we can gather together, not only reconciled to you, but reconciled to one another, and one day to be reconciled to all things in the universe. We thank you for your purposes, your plan, and right now as we navigate this life in a mixed condition with uh, hearts and motives that rage against the things that please you within us, while simultaneously having things in us that you have produced that long to love you and serve you. We wait with eager anticipation for the reconciliation of all things. We do pray, even as the song we just sung and as you taught us to pray while you were on earth, Oh, Lord, let your kingdom come. Surely that will be your vindication when every tongue will confess that you are Lord. Indeed, every knee will bow. Every petty tyrant will yield his pretend sovereignty to your kingship, your rule, and your reign, which will have no end. We long for that day. We ask this morning as we look at your word that you would use it to propel our hearts to vigorous activity for the sake of populating your kingdom with citizens redeemed through the gospel. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you found yourself in a difficult situation, overwhelmed by hardship, perhaps outmanned by enemies and outgunned by the bad guys, facing opposition beyond your own capabilities, who would you look to for help? Who would you call? Where would you turn? In the 1980s hit television show, The A-Team, every episode began with this explanation. And I wish I could do it in that movie man voice. I won't try. In 1972, a crack commando unit was sent to prison by a military court for a crime they didn't commit. These men promptly escaped from a maximum security stockade to the Los Angeles underground. Today, still wanted by the government, they survive as soldiers of fortune. If you have a problem, if no one else can help, and if you can find them, perhaps you can hire the A-Team. Hannibal Smith, Face Man, Mad Murdoch, and B.A. Baracus were the four-man army of misfit operatives for hire, ready to get you out of trouble. They would weld up crazy armor-plated contraptions. They would fire thousands of rounds of ammunition without hurting anyone. Somehow they would get B.A. Baracus, who was mortally afraid of flying, onto some aircraft piloted by a man deemed clinically unfit to fly and insane, all to help you out of a jam. And when you face trouble beyond your resources, where do you turn? You can't call the A-Team. That TV show ended in 1987, and it was fictional, as I learned to my disappointment. This morning in our text, we see the Apostle Paul modeling for us where to turn for help. I invite you to look at your Bibles in Romans chapter 15. We'll read the last four verses of chapter 15, beginning in verse 30. Paul writes to the Roman believers, Now I urge you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be rescued from those who are disobedient in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may prove acceptable to the saints. I pray that I may come to you in joy by the will of God and find refreshing rest in your company. Now, the God of peace be with you all. Amen. There was trouble ahead for the Apostle Paul. We looked at this last week. He was making his planned itinerary back to Jerusalem. 
And that itinerary included plans for him to come back to Rome to be refreshed by the believers there and then to go on in missionary endeavor beyond Rome to places where Christ had not yet been named. But what will happen in Jerusalem? What will happen on the way and on the way back? What will unbelieving Jews do when he shows his face in the city again? To the Jews who rejected Messiah, the Apostle Paul was a Benedict Arnold. He was a traitor. He had shifted allegiances. He had defected to the enemy. Now, what will happen to this turncoat Pharisee cavorting with Gentiles and promising God's covenant grace to them when he shows up in the midst of the Jews he left behind? How will the Jewish Christians respond? Under pressure from their unbelieving countrymen when Paul shows up with a Gentile contribution to meet the needs of believing Jews in Jerusalem. Will Paul's presence disrupt the peace? Will his gift be rejected? As Gentile believers had been rejected from the table fellowship previously. Where does Paul turn here? Paul turns to the Christians in Rome and enlists them to pray on his behalf in his dangerous journey back to Jerusalem. We're going to look at this, Paul, this request from Paul for the Roman believers in three parts. First, we look at Paul's prayer recruitment. He is going to enlist Christians in Rome to pray on his behalf. And in doing this, he is seeking the Lord's help. But he's seeking the Lord's help through means of believers gathered together in prayer, seeking the Lord's help together. Look what Paul says, verse 30. Now I urge you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. He calls them brethren, that is, he is speaking to the Christians who would be reading this letter. And he says, I urge you, and the word for urge here is a strong word. He's not just asking for prayer. He is exhorting the Roman believers to pray. This is a strong appeal, an exhortation. He is urging them. It's like what he says in chapter 12, verse 1. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. There is the flavor here of a command. This is not an urge that you respond to. Okay, that's optional. Paul wants me to pray, but I think I'll pray for other things. I believe here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and by apostolic authority, Paul is giving the Roman believers a command. And there in 12.1 where he said, By the mercies of God, I urge you to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. He invoked the weighty witness to this urgent request, and there the mercies of God outlined for 11 chapters in this letter to the Romans provided a freight train of incentive for Christians to offer their bodies as living sacrifices. Charles Spurgeon said this, Thou didst die for me, and shall I not live to thee? What a love is this that Jesus gave to me, it surpasses knowledge. I can do nothing in return, but give thee my worthless self. The mercies of God were an incentive to offer ourselves completely and wholly to service to Christ. And here in 1530, Paul appeals to the authority of Jesus Christ. And he says here, this is our Lord. There is a commonality under the lordship of Jesus Christ in this appeal. He is your Lord and my Lord. We are mutually under Christ. I urge you by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit. The appeal to the lordship of Christ was an appeal to authority. The appeal to the love of the Spirit is an appeal to motive. This love that the Holy Spirit has produced in the lives of believers. Romans chapter 5, the Holy Spirit shed abroad God's love in our hearts. And that love comes in vertically from God by the Holy Spirit into the heart of a believer and reflects outward into mutual love for one another in the body of Christ. And Paul appeals to the authority of the Lordship of Christ and the love produced by the Holy Spirit of Christ to make appeal that, Russia, uh, that uh, Roman believers, I don't know where I got Russians, Roman <laughs> believers would pray for Paul. 
Paul makes appeal to the Holy Spirit-generated love between himself and the Christians at Rome to motivate their participation with him in his crucial mission to Jerusalem and back. And Paul knows he needs help. He needs help for what lies ahead, and he's eager to enlist the help of the Christians at Rome. But Paul has never yet been to Rome. He's not planning to take any of the Roman Christians with him. He's not building an A-team or an armor-plated chariot. He's not stockpiling ammunition. How can the Roman Christians possibly help him? He's asking for their help. What can they do? They're not going to go with him. He says, help me by striving together with me in your prayers to God for me. Verse 30. To strive together here is the verb to agonize together. It is to contend, to struggle in a contest, to fight alongside with somebody. And where is this together agony taking place? Paul says, in prayer. This is not casual prayer, but a battling with Paul, alongside of Paul in his endeavor. This prayer is a struggle. And Charles Spurgeon, who prayed often and prayed well, said this, Prayer seems like a labor to me. The chariot wheels drag heavily, yet the wheels are still on. He goes on and says, I will rely still upon almighty strength and helpless. I will throw myself into the arms of my Redeemer. Have you ever felt like prayer was hard? Have you ever felt like you needed your prayers to be prayed for? That's a good thing to do. Ask God for help in asking God for help. And here the Apostle Paul is asking the Roman Christians to struggle together, wrestle together, strive, contend together with him in prayer. In prayer to God, the only one who can truly help. Our our trust is not in man. Our trust is not in methods. It is not in strategies or in human strength. But our hope is in the Lord himself who works wonders that human efforts could never touch. And Paul says, pray for me. He urges prayer on his own behalf. This was a way, this was a powerful way that Roman Christians could actually labor with Paul in his labors. They couldn't be with him there in Jerusalem. They couldn't take spears in hand or mount horses to surround him when the mob attacked. They couldn't stand in his place before Gallio, before Felix or Festus or Herod Agrippa II. But they could pray. And that is what he asks for here. Paul had well-founded fears. Paul was going anyway, and he enlisted help. This is fear, courage, and help in this request. Have you ever said or thought, well, all we can do is pray, as if we've exhausted all other possible helps? (laughs) That's all we could ever really do. If we understand where true help is, my help comes from the Lord. Uh, Human efforts are often mocked by God's providential circumstances. You know, we plan, we try, we strategize, and so often we live as practical atheists, independent, when truly what God desires from us and often brings trials into our lives to produce a newfound dependence on him as the only one who can supply our help in time of need. Paul recognized this. He enlists the Roman believers to join him in this, to strive together with Paul in his mission by prayer. They are really with him in his struggles when they pray. And so we strive together with Wayman Lee. We don't fly to five continents to train pastors, but Wayman does, and we wrestle with him in those labors by prayer. We strive together with Massimo Malica. I don't know Italian. I can hardly get through the menu at Oregano's across the street. We're a long way from that spiritually dark corner of Europe, 
but we can labor daily for precious souls of people there who need desperately to be freed from spiritual blindness. We strive together with the Malakas in prayer. We strive together with Zach Can and the team in Papua New Guinea. We don't know Melanesian pigeon or the doe language. Most of us in this room. A couple of you in this room, no pigeon. But we do know the language of prayer. And so we labor, we strive, we contend along with Zach and Cass and Ryan and Elna and Amelia. We strive together this week with the student ministry staff. Some of you will go away this weekend and not sleep because you're serving our high schoolers and junior hires. You will come back weary and unable to cope with life for the next several days. We're thankful. And I'm thankful it's you and not me. And we as a church will labor with you in your labors in a different way than you're laboring. We must labor in prayer, recognizing that the real work that must be done at winter camp is at the heart level with students. And we will beg of the Lord to radically transform lives by the gospel, to strengthen young ones who love Christ in their faith, and to give great encouragement to those faithful servants who serve in student ministry staff. We come secondly, after Paul's enlisting of believers to pray with him, we come to Paul's actual prayer requests in verses 31 and 32. And Paul here gives two sections of prayer requests, one in verse 31, which is his ministry in Jerusalem, pray for the ministry to Jerusalem. And then in verse 32, he's asking the Roman believers to pray for his return journey, hopefully all the way back to Rome with some specific purposes. And we begin in verse 31 with his ministry to Jerusalem. And he asks for a pair of things here, for rescue from enemies and reception among friends. Rescue from enemies and reception among friends. First of all, he asks for rescue from enemies. Look at the first half of verse 31. Pray to God for me that I may be rescued from those who are disobedient in Judea. Those who are disobedient to God, those who are disobedient to the gospel, those who with murderous rage against the church believe that they are obeying God when they have in fact rejected God when he came to the earth in the flesh in Messiah Jesus. They are opposed to this gospel work. They are enemies of the gospel. And because Paul has embraced the gospel, they have become enemies of Paul personally. And Paul understands this opposition, this enmity, he understands it at a theological level, and he certainly understands it at a personal and experiential level. Theologically, let's think about the situation in, in uh, Judea and in Jerusalem particularly for just a moment. Paul asked the question in Romans 3.1, a rhetorical question, what advantage then has the Jew? Right? If, if Gentiles are all condemned by their sin and Jews alike are all condemned by their sin... And the only hopes in the gospel, what benefit is there in being a Jew at all? And Paul says, much in every way. First of all, they had the very oracles of God. That is, it was an amazing privilege to have the word of God, the Old Testament, the voice of the prophets, to have had the temple sacrifices and all the types and shadows of the good things to come in Christ and have access to God. What a remarkable thing. What inestimable privileges. And it broke Paul's heart that his countrymen, in spite of all of those privileges, had by and large rejected the very thing that those pointed to. Messiah's come. They remained in unbelief, despite having the word of God. In Romans 11.8, Paul explains this theologically. It is written, he says, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not and ears to hear not, down to this very day. And he makes here a reference to the truth in Isaiah 6 and in Isaiah 29 and Deuteronomy 29. I'll read to you from Isaiah 6. The year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah got to see Christ Cross-reference John 12, the one who was holy, high, and exalted. John 12, 41 says, with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
After seeing the pre-incarnate Christ in glorified vision, Isaiah is commissioned by the Lord to go and preach God's message to his people. And God says to Isaiah, go and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. God commissions Isaiah to preach to people who will not hear, who will not see, and who will not believe. That's a somewhat disappointing job description and assignment. What's going on here? This is, in fact, the judicial hardening of God's people who had the very oracles of God in hand and who gave God lip service. Who didn't worship Him from the heart but rejected the voice of God in His Word and missed God altogether so that when Messiah came in the flesh, they were not just ambivalent to Him, but antagonistic to him, murderously so. And the nation as a whole committed what we might call deicide. God in the flesh, and they killed him. Isaiah 53 is a lament. It is a song. It is a sorrowful dirge belonging to Israel over their own treatment of Messiah. And this dirge, written 700 years before Messiah came, will be sung one day by believing Israel when they look back and see what they did. But the opening line of chapter 53 has this question, who has believed our message? What a tragedy. That the message of the suffering servant who would come and actually rescue from sin, who would one day be the reigning king on the earth, and bring about all of God's promises, that message was disbelieved by the very people through whom the message came. And so you get these really very personal pronouns throughout Isaiah 53. Surely our griefs he bore. The hour there is Israel. And while it's true that Jesus is the sin bearer for all who would believe, the tone of this lament is ultimately sorrow over Israel's rejection of Messiah. And Paul knew this was the state they were in. Who has believed the message? No, they are hardened in unbelief. They are not neutral to the truth. They are antagonistic to the truth. They were murderous of Messiah, and they will be murderous of all who come in his name. Paul included. And Paul knows this by personal experience. He's already experienced this murderous intent. Acts 9, 29 and 30. He was talking and arguing with Hellenistic Jews, but they were attempting to put him to death. When the brethren learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus. Acts 13, 45. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. Notice the motive there. They began contradicting the things spoken by Paul and they were blaspheming. Verse 50, the Jews incited the devout women of prominence and the leading men of the city. They instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of the district. Acts 14, 2, the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. Acts 14:5. when an attempt was made by the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to mistreat and to stone them, And verse 19, Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. Having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Acts 17, 5 and 6, the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar, and they attacked the house of Jason. They were seeking to bring them out to the people. When they did not find Paul and Barnabas, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have upset the world have come here also. In Acts 18, 12, and 13, when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him before the judgment seat, saying, this man persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And as punishment under the Jews... 
Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, five times I received the 39 lashes. Why 39 lashes? Mosaic law allowed for 40. You weren't supposed to die from the lashes. And the Jews added another little extra rule in case they miscounted. They didn't want to violate Mosaic law. It wasn't out of compassion. So five times Paul was beaten 39 times with the lash. Paul knew by personal experience the manifestations of hard-hearted unbelief in Judea, in Jerusalem. That when he writes Romans, he has already experienced these things. And there's another way that Paul knew by personal experience. Turn to Acts chapter 7. Paul had been called Saul. Stephen, one of the early Christians, preached a sermon about Jesus as Messiah. They didn't like it. They decided to put Stephen to death by throwing rocks at him. And look at verse 58. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him, and the witnesses laid their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Look at verse 1 of chapter 8. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting Stephen to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria, except some of the apostles. Verse 3, Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women. He would put them into prison. Look at chapter 9, verse 1. Saul, breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest, asked for letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Paul knew. Paul knew about the animus of unrepentant Judaism against Jewish Christians. And Paul knew by personal experience the increased animus of a message that promised God's grace to Gentiles, those wretched outsiders. So what could Roman Christians do for Paul with the threat of such opposition in Rome? They could pray. Struggling alongside of Paul in prayer on Paul's behalf for protection from the enemies of the gospel in Jerusalem. And we saw those prayers answered. We looked at that last week. The remarkable rescue of Paul by the Roman commander, the centurions, the foot soldiers, the cavalry came to Paul's rescue. We understand what was behind the cavalry. God himself and the prayers of his people. Even the prayers of Christians at Rome on Paul's behalf. The twin to this first prayer request uh, that Paul would be rescued from enemies is that he would have a good reception among friends. Look at the second half of verse 31. Paul says that also my service for Jerusalem may prove acceptable to the saints. You remember from last week that Paul has been taking a collection amongst Gentile churches everywhere he has gone to serve the physical needs of poor Christians, Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. It was a number of years ago that Grace Bible Church benefited from a sizable monetary gift from another local assembly of Christians. It was humbling. It came to this church in a time of crisis, in a time of great need, in a time of uncertainty about whether or not this church would survive. And a local church gave a sizable monetary gift. What a tremendous encouragement that was for gospel proclamation at Grace Bible Church. What a remarkable unity in purpose and in affections it produced between two local churches. 
what camaraderie, what a remarkable gift. It hasn't been forgotten. And you can imagine what a demonstration of love from Gentile churches in all the regions outside of Jerusalem and Judea coming into the churches at Jerusalem would produce for those Jewish Christians in desperate need. That we have a camaraderie, a compatriotism in the gospel with people who have never met us, never seen us. People we couldn't ask personally for help and they have demonstrated love. But this gift presented a very delicate situation. What was the state of Jew-Gentile relationships in Jerusalem at this time? How would the gift be taken? Would Jews feel like a Gentile gift was dirty, contaminated? Would Jewish believers be skeptical of the motives of such a gift? Or might Jewish believers fall into the trap of imbibing the prejudices of their unbelieving countrymen against the Gentiles? If the Jerusalem church received the gift well, they would be acknowledging God's gracious work amongst the Gentiles, outlying regions, people that said they now loved God but didn't keep the customs. They were uncircumcised. They were not under Mosaic law. They didn't keep dietary restrictions. They didn't come and worship at the temple. And yet they were now fully the people of God with direct access to Israel's God through Israel's Messiah, whom Israel crucified. Such a reception would go a long way toward unity of Jew-Gentile believers in Christ. But a generous reception of that gift would also go a long way towards division between Jewish believers and Jewish unbelievers. Do you understand? People that were bound by ethnicity, but divided by the gospel. Well, such a gift from outside Gentile believers in Christ would drive a wedge between ethnicity while it promoted a unity in the gospel. And faith in Jesus does that. It cuts across the grain of superficial similarities and temporary solidarities. We are together because of skin color or language or lineage or culture or food or music or traditions. But in Christ... Anyone from any culture, from any ethnicity, now possesses a blood-bought unity and a God-wrought solidarity that will stand for all of eternity. Christian, you know that you have far more in common with people who don't look like you, don't dress like you, don't eat like you, don't listen to the same music that you listen to, who don't even speak the same language. People that you've never met you have an infinitely greater solidarity with them than you do with people who live near you who look and act and dress just like you do based on lineage and ethnicity. Christian, you are in Christ and your identity is wrapped up in Christ. And whatever superficial similarities we have with one another, they are but brief, temporal, momentary, and light. And we recognize that God has, in some sense, rescued ethnic diversity, linguistic diversity. He is populating heaven with a people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. But what brings them all together and even separates them out from their natural ethnicities is supernatural power and the infinite cost of the blood of Jesus Christ For men of every tribe. This was real tension in the first century. And a gift given in love by Gentile believers was actually a threat to a believing church in Jerusalem. If that church valued superficial ethnic similarity over and against gospel solidarity. Jerusalem Christian reception of Gentile monetary contribution would profoundly preach peace and enmity. Simultaneous peace and division. Peace and unity in Christ. 
and a division from the world. It would inflame Jew-on-Jew persecution. Paul, the Jew, was persecuted by Jews because he had the audacity to be seen in Jerusalem with a Gentile. Jew-on-Jew persecution for acknowledging God's love and purpose for Gentiles. And would Jewish Christians be willing to sacrifice ethnic solidarity relationships in order to embrace God's gospel love for Gentiles that they've never even met? That was a real question in Paul's mind, and he asked for prayer. Have you ever had to decide for Jesus against ethnic pressure, cultural identities, or antagonisms from family? Look, if you're in Russia and you believe the gospel, you're considered no longer Russian. If you come from a Roman Catholic family and you reject Roman Catholicism, you can be excommunicated from your family. Many times to be Italian is to be Catholic, so if you embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're no longer Italian somehow. Look, these things aren't new and they're not isolated to the things we might be tempted to think about about the last 10 years in American culture or the last 200. These are real concerns. Paul was concerned. He asked for prayer. Paul already had reason to be concerned. In Acts 15, 5, which predates this letter to Rome. We read this. Some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise Gentiles and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. And the apostles and the elders took it under consideration. And what you have following is the Acts 15 Jerusalem Council where the first Christians, the Jewish believing in Christ Christians at the church in Jerusalem had to wrestle with this question. Do we have to make Gentiles be Jewish in order to have Christ and therefore have access to God? And their conclusion to that was no. And there are synagogues all over the place. Be sensitive. Be thoughtful. Be loving towards our Jewish countrymen. In Acts 21, we read that false rumors were spread about Paul. Jews who believed at the church began glorifying God. They said to him, you see, brother, how many thousands of of these there are among the Jews who have believed, and they're all zealous for the law. And listen to this, the, the Jewish Christians zealous for the law were told about Paul that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses telling them not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to the customs. This bleeds over into a riot. When seven days were over, the Jews from Asia, upon seeing Paul in the temple, began to stir up the crowd. They laid hands on him. They cried out, Men of Israel, come to our aid. This is the man who preaches to all men everywhere against our people, against the law, and against this place. And besides, he's even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled the holy place. For they had seen Trophimus the Ephesian in the city with him. Then all the city was provoked. The people rushed together. They took hold of Paul. They dragged him out of the temple. And immediately the doors were shut. And they were seeking to kill him. And that's where Paul was rescued by the Roman cohort. Unbelieving Jews were offended that Paul had even been seen with a Gentile. Is Paul the Uncle Tom of first century Judea? That's the accusation. Would the believers succumb to the pressures of the unbelieving world? That is a question for all Christians in every generation. The world is meandering down its path to self-destruction and under God's judgment. And will the Christian world conform to the pressures? Romans 12, 2, do not be squeezed into the mold. The church is always seeming to do what the world does, but just a couple months behind This is an ever-present danger. Whatever the world is up in arms about, the church seems to follow. We get suckered into esteeming the temporal concerns and the backward values of a world bent on its own destruction. That's crazy for the church to do. We were bought with a price. We were separated out. We belong to Christ. We're different. We're weird. That's okay. 
Acts 24, 17, by the way, suggests that the church in Jerusalem did in fact receive the gift as intended. Gentile love and appreciation for being grafted into Jewish promises. Can you believe it? Yay, the Gentiles are in too. Paul simply reports in Acts 24 that he dropped off the gift. This leads to a second prayer request. This in verse 32. And I believe that this is, in fact, a second prayer request um, rather than the purpose for the first prayer request, although in the end, either way you take that comes out the same. But the verse 32 begins with the exact same phrase, the exact same word that verse 31 begins with. And so I see these as two separate requests for prayer. The second prayer request is for Paul's return journey leading him back to Rome. He says he wants to come to Rome He wants to do so in joy. All of this is subjected to the will of God, and he wants to be refreshed in their company. Look at this request. Pray so that I may come to you in joy by the will of God and find refreshing rest in your company. He wants to get back to Rome. He has already described this desire, and he wants to get to Rome as a launching point for the gospel going beyond Rome, and he wants to do so in joy. And I think the joy would be produced if he's rescued from his enemies and if the Jerusalem church receives the Gentile gift well. And then Roman Christian prayers will have been answered. And Paul can rejoice with them in their partnership with him in that crucial ministry. And yet this caveat is important. Subject to the will of God. By the will of God I may come to you. He recognizes that a man may plan his steps, but the Lord directs his path. And Paul did not get back to the Rome, get back to Rome in the way that he perhaps imagined. He was in chains. He was not a free man. But Paul did get to have encouraging ministry. We have a hint of this in Philippians chapter 1. I'll read verses 12 and 13. I want you to know, brethren, he says to the Philippian believers, that my circumstances, what circumstances? Uh, The riot in Jerusalem leading to his being captured, leading to two years imprisonment, uh, perhaps a little bit more, and all the trouble leading up to Rome and then being under house arrest, under guard, not a free man when he gets to Rome. My circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, So that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard. Boy, that's an unusual place for the gospel to have gotten. How would those elite guard soldiers of the Roman army, those untouchable, top-notch guys, how would they ever hear about Messiah Jesus? Ah, if Paul's chained to some of them. (laughs) And that became known to the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment. Wait, they're they're not running away from Paul because of of his imprisonment? You mean believing the gospel got him in jail? I don't want to go to jail. No, they were actually emboldened and encouraged in the cause of the gospel because of how the Lord sustained Paul in his imprisonment. And they have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. That's successful, encouraging, refreshing, fruitful ministry and an answer to prayer. We conclude this section with Paul's own prayer in verse 33. This is sort of a doxological prayer desire. This is what Paul wants. He is invoking the Lord directly here. He says, now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. And he praises in a very short prayer here one of God's attributes. He is the God of peace. That is, he is the God characterized by peace, probably here designated as the God who is the source of peace. And Paul invokes God to be specially with the Roman believers. Rome was probably not immune to Jew-Gentile tensions in the church. I think that explains much of the material in the letter to the Romans. 
explaining Jew and Gentile relationships. And so Paul asks that the God of peace be specially with them. This is the God who brings peace. He is the God who actually can powerfully, decisively make peace. We'll learn more about that in a couple of weeks in chapter 16. <clears throat> this is the God, according to Romans 5.1, who has made peace with us, having declared us righteous on the basis of faith. This is the God, according to Ephesians 2.14, who broke down the barriers to bring Jew and Gentile together into one body, the church. This is the God who is reconciling all things to himself in Christ. God will have peace. All of his enemies will be subdued. Paul prays here that God will specially be with the Christians in Rome, and as they participate with Paul in his mission, they may have opportunity to see this particular prayer answered. If these prayers are answered, Paul will be rescued from the unbelievers. The Jews in Jerusalem will receive the Gentile gift as it was intended in love and solidarity in the gospel. And Paul will be able finally to see them and to be refreshed by them when he comes finally to Rome. Now this chapter 15 ends with an amen. And maybe you've listened to sermons and the preacher says, and finally, for my last point, and then he speaks for another half hour. I'm not going to do that this morning, but you need to know there is still more to this letter to the Romans. There's an amen here, but about four weeks more in the last chapter before we say goodbye to this friend. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this letter even the way Paul has modeled for us where to turn in times of need, in times of imminent danger and almost sure mortal peril. He prays and he asks God's people to wrestle with him, struggle with him, agonize with him in prayer, to labor with him in his labors. Oh Lord, we don't pray enough. We don't pray as we should. Prayer is hard. We are so easily distracted and impatient. Help us, O oh God, to pray. We pray for our prayers. We pray that we might be those who truly partner with our friends in Papua New Guinea and with Wayman Lee and a host of pastors on many continents and with student ministry staff and with the Malakas in Italy that we would labor in prayer for one another as we go out from this place into our various walks of life with the gospel. And we pray even now that you would send us out as ministers of your grace and ministers of your peace to take the gospel to everything that moves, to labor in prayer with one another to that end for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.